Hi, my name is Jen. I'm the Learning and Engagement Lead at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. Today's session is called The Art of Our Relationships for Grades 2 to 5. We're going to explore and discuss some paintings and play some games. Hopefully, by the end of the session, you'll learn a little bit more about yourself and your classmates. What I want everyone to keep in mind is that there are no right or wrong answers, just different opinions and perspectives or ways of seeing. So what is a relationship? How would you define it? It's a connection, interaction, and bond between two or more people. What different kinds of relationships can you think of? Work, family, romantic, whether it's dating or marriage, friendship, self. So today we're going to look at artworks from two exhibitions. One is called Journeys and the other is Who Were the Painters 11 and Why Are They Important to the RMG? As well as other artworks from our collection. Let's get started. I'm here with someone who I have a work or professional relationship with. Her name is Sonia Jones. She's the curator of collections here at the gallery. Her and I work together with other staff members, volunteers, and members of the public to support and share artists and their works with our community. Artists have a lot to say about the world we live in. Thanks for joining me, Sonia. I'm happy to be here, Jen. Can you tell me a bit more about what you do at the gallery? Absolutely. I curate exhibitions and care for the collection. What that means is that I choose artworks to be included in exhibitions usually based on a theme. In the case of journeys, the artworks depict different kinds of journeys that we go on in life, whether it's just getting places like transportation or more of a personal journey of discovery. I then design the show by making connections between artworks and placing works based on those connections. In the Painters 11 exhibition, you can see that the connections are based on similar colors and style. I also take care of the collection, making sure that it's properly stored so that the artworks last a very long time. Such beautiful exhibitions. How long does it take to organize exhibitions like these? Who is involved? It can take anywhere from a year to a few months. I have a lot of help though when it comes time to hang the artworks on the walls. My coworker Mike is the preparator, which means that he hangs and installs artworks. So, a lot of work is put into organizing these exhibitions. Let's check back in with Sonia in a little while. She will share with us a bit more about the exhibitions and a couple of the artworks. As I was walking around the Journeys exhibition, I was thinking about professional or work relationships people have with each other. The Hunter's relationship is probably the most obvious. We might have to imagine the working relationships that go on behind the scenes of the other two paintings. What about the working relationships people have with animals? Think about how police dogs work with their handlers. Also, the animals in these artworks. Consider what their relationship might be. Not only animals can be part of a working relationship, what about our pets? There's more of a friendship, some would even say family. During the early part of the quarantine, lots of people adopted a new pet. Staying home meant that they had more time to take on the responsibility of a pet but also animals give people a connection, a new friendship. Have you ever adopted a pet, maybe from a shelter or rescue organization? There is a questionnaire that people have to fill out to make sure they are matched with the right kind of pet and if they would make good owners. What type of questions do you think are important to ask? Here's an adoption form I found. Did you have some of the same questions? 
As you can imagine, adoption takes time to make sure everyone will be happy with the new relationship. With pets in mind, I looked around the exhibition in search of family portraits that might include pets. I didn't find any, but I did find this. The whole artwork is a sculpture. It includes both the table and the books. Sculptures are pieces of art that are three-dimensional, meaning it must have height, width, and depth. Here's Sonia again to tell us more about the artist. Surinder Dhaliwal was born in India and moved with her family to England when she was very young. When she was young, she used to visit the library to read fairy tales. She loved the pictures and colors in the books. This artwork is about her love of reading, her love of color, and her love of those fairy tale books from the library. It's also about her relationship with her mom. When she was little and living in India, girls were discouraged from reading. Her mother worried that she was reading too much and that it was going to distract her from her school studies. So this very colorful sculpture is about many things, including the differences between traditions and practices from when she was growing up. Sarinda grew up in the 60s and today, differences in tradition and practices are more accepted, but more work could and needs to be done. Sarinda's mother also did not read and thought spending time with fairy books might take away from Sarinda's focus on school and homework. It was those childhood experiences that helped make Sarinda the person and artist she is today. There may be times you do things on your own since it might be something that you only enjoy. Are there things that you do that your family members don't like to do? My boys love video games. I do not. That's okay. What are some of the things that you do that make you happy? We form a clear understanding of what we like or don't like early on. From there, we form our own opinions about the world we live in. Is it okay to have different opinions than family or friends? Certainly. Sometimes, the love of hobbies or sports come from people around us. Think about your hobbies. Did someone in your family teach you how to skate and now you like to figure skate or play hockey? Did your friends ask you to join a club that you didn't know anything about until you tried it? We may not know what we like or don't like until we try it. I know I love to garden. I like trying out new color combinations of flowers. Because I love color so much, I notice right away the beautiful use of color. Why are the books different colors? I'm not sure, but it definitely caught my eye. I'm also an organized person. I love sorting. How many different ways can you organize these colorful books? Cool colors, warm colors, rainbow, light to dark, favorite color to least favorite color. There's so many different ways to look at the world around us. So what are the books about? Careful inspection tells me that there are probably no words in the books themselves. Notice the pages in the books look very different from books you may have or seen. These pages are handmade papers. They look delicate and maybe too special to write on. But there are titles. What do the words say? If I try to read the titles of each book, they don't make sense. Then how do you read it? I get it. I have to read across like I would read a book. Here is what it says. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who loved learning to read, sitting on the floor between the stacks in the public library, surrounded by piles of books. The green fairy book, the yellow fairy book, the red, the blue, the lavender fairy book. She's convinced many years on that there was even a violet, lilac, and purple book. This love of color is reflected in much of her later life. Gambodge, Heliotrope, Rose Matter, Matter Lake, this work represents a resolution of sorts, a coming home to the place where all the narratives has written began. 
What does Gamvage, Heliotrope, Rose Matter, and Matter Lake mean? I had to Google each one. Here's what I found. So they are different colors, colors often found in nature. They may even be the colors you used to dye the paper. So, when was the last time you read a book? Or the last time someone read you a story? What was it about? Storytelling itself has been around for a long time, even before writing. Storytelling is important because it not only helps people connect, but it can be a learning opportunity. Every culture has its own stories or narratives, which are shared as a means of entertainment, education, cultural preservation, or instilling moral values. Is there a story in your culture that someone has shared with you? I wonder if there are any artworks in this exhibition that tell a story. In fact, there are artworks called narratives that either tell a particular story or ask us to make our own story. Here are some of the examples I found in the Journeys exhibition. Maybe you have some narrative artworks at home. Let's play a game. Has anyone played Snap? This game is similar, but we will be using artworks and our feelings for this one. I'm going to show you six paintings, and you are going to have less than a minute in between to write down a word or draw a simple picture of how that painting makes you feel. After, the artworks are going to appear again. Teacher, please pause after each artwork Select a student to stand up to reveal their emotion. Other students, if your answers match, I want you to bang your desk or table with your hand. Please be careful. Students, please consider what is it about this artwork that makes you feel that way? This game will show us how similar you may feel about an artwork, but also differences within the class. Remember, there is no right or wrong answer. Let's start.
you probably already noticed that you may have snapped or not snapped at some of the same images as your classmates. Does everyone in the relationship have to have the same feelings, opinions, beliefs, have the same experiences? No, we are our own person. Some students may have even chosen to draw a picture with that game. Have you ever heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words? Sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes one small picture is enough to tell us about what someone might be trying to say. Do we understand this emotion? Maybe you use emojis. I know some people that use them every day. Emojis can be quick messages to connect to someone. What do these emojis mean? Did you know that there are 3,340 emojis as of March 2020? And there are more added all the time. And it all started back in 2012. They certainly were not around when I was growing up. So many emojis are used to help describe how people are feeling. What about artists? How do they paint feelings? This is certainly one way. Even some narrative paintings can make us feel a certain way as they may remind us of some of the things that happen in our own lives. This is a photograph by someone who lives in the Oshawa area. His name is AJ Groen and he called his photograph three on a bike sneak. He captured a moment of what I think is a mother and child riding a bike. What words would you use to describe how the riders might be feeling? Who is enjoying the ride? One? Both? None? Feelings can change quickly throughout one experience. How? What can happen to change the current mood? Maybe the little girl sees her favorite animal, kittens playing on the sidewalk. Or maybe they fell off their bike. What can you do if you're feeling sad, mad, frustrated? Let's play a snowball toss game to let go of negative feelings. Students, think of a time when things didn't go your way or how you expected it to go. How did it feel? Teacher, follow up a piece of paper and give the paper to someone to start the toss. That student says their feeling word and then throws the paper to someone else and they say their word and toss the snowball onto another student, moving the snowball around the class. Or instead of a piece of paper, you can use an imaginary snowball for this activity. Being able to let go of some emotions is important. Hopefully, at some point in the exercise, there was laughter. Laughter is said to ease feelings of stress. There is a saying that goes, laughter is the best medicine, and sometimes it is. Let's move on. This painting is called All Aboard by Isabel McLaughlin. This painting is filled with passengers traveling together. Do you think everyone knows each other? Are they leaving, passing by, or coming in? What could be happening here? Is it a wedding, a boat tour, people going home, people moving or on vacation, having a party? Since we really don't know, we can make it up. How many different types of motion might be in the boat? We can't see their faces, but we can guess based on our own experiences. Here is a list. Happy, adventurous, excited, fun, busy, scary, uncomfortable, overwhelming, boring, crowded, sad, mad. For some people, a situation like this might make them feel happy, adventurous, excited, but for other people it might be more scary, overwhelming, or even boring. What emotions are the right answer?
If you guessed all of them, then you are correct. All of these words might apply. There actually might be other feelings that I never thought about. Everyone has different ways of experiencing the world around them. Being able to recognize other people's emotions is called empathy. Empathy is the ability to share someone's feelings or experiences by imagining what it would be like to be in that person's situation. So what do you do when you're feeling down? Do you think it's okay to cry? Do you think it's okay to yell? Yes, we all have those feelings from time to time. It's okay. It's important to have those feelings, understand them, but then move on from them. Is there another way artists paint feelings or emotions? Abstract art is modern art, which may not look like anything we may have seen before. It has color, lines, and shapes, but they are not intended to represent objects or living things. In particular, with abstract expressionism, artists are influenced by feelings and thoughts about the things around them. One of the important things about abstraction is that you are part of the art. You can guess what the artist is trying to paint or even make up your own meaning. This exhibition is called Who Were Painters 11 and Why Are They Important to the RMG? Painters 11 was the first abstract group in Ontario. Their love of art connected them together, in particular, abstract art. Now let's play another game. Teacher, make six small pieces of paper and mark one of them with a circle. Hand out the pieces of paper to a few students in the class. The person who gets the circle should start to hum. Hum like this. It doesn't have to be a song. It can just be humming. Now, students need to look around at the students who were given the piece of paper. And if you make eye contact with the person who is humming and that person winks or clearly blinks at you, you have to start humming too. And you get to wink or blink at other classmates to get them to join in the humming until the room is filled with sound. Once you achieve that, Resume the video. As one person, it's hard for everyone to hear the sound or even know who's humming, and it might be a bit embarrassing. Did it matter too much? Not really, once everyone started to hum. Two things happened. One, someone was no longer alone. Two, you formed a kind of community. You had something in common with everyone else. There are still differences as people were humming differently than each other, but still a community. For some, community means a group of people sharing common social characteristics, physical space, ideas, beliefs, or activities. By concerning each other's lives and experiences and perspectives, we allowed a community not only to be about what we have in common, but what makes us different. Discuss how many different communities could you be part of? Classroom community, school community, neighborhood community, city community, sports teams, clubs, cultural community, spiritual community. How does this relate to the artworks in the Painters 11 exhibition? With understanding, respect, and support, the Painters 11 were able to successfully showcase their artwork together at a time when few people knew about or even understood abstract art. Working with our community, regardless of what kind of community it is, we can be successful by supporting and respecting and understanding one another. Let's take a closer look at this painting called Clown by Walter Yarwood. Why is it called Clown? I didn't see a clown. I saw two olives riding a teeter-totter. Someone else pointed that this might be a really close-up view of a clown's face. The green may be the eyes and the blue might be the bridge of the nose. What's your relationship with clowns? Do you like them or not like them? Never seen one before? There are many people who are really afraid of clowns. Being really afraid and having a very strong reaction to something is called a phobia. A phobia of clowns is a real thing. It's called chlorophobia. So I am not going to show any other paintings of clowns in case there is someone in your class or even your teacher who may not like clowns very much. We must respect everyone's feelings. Some people are afraid or may even have a phobia of bugs and insects, animals, the dark, heights, 
thunder and lightning. Again, it's important to respect everyone's feelings. So why would an artist do that? Why paint a clown? Other than the fact that this is an opportunity to play with colors and shapes, maybe it says more about him as an artist. This is Walter Yarwood, who taught himself how to paint, and he was a laid-back, easy-going person. Maybe this painting is telling us that he doesn't take things too seriously. Let's move on. The next artwork is a very large artwork by William Ronald. It's called Homage to Martin Baldwin. What is homage? Who is Martin Baldwin? Homage means an expression of great respect and honor, deep respect and often praise shown for a person. Martin Baldwin was the first person who bought this artist's artwork for an art gallery. William Ronald must have admired Martin Baldwin a lot to make a painting in his honor. Think of someone you know that you might look up to. Who could you paint a picture of? So if William Ronald looked up to Martin Baldwin, then I wonder what the colors and lines might mean. How do you think the artist sees his mentor? I think Martin Baldwin must have been a very easygoing, vibrant, energetic person who wasn't afraid to be bold and make decisions that may not be the same decisions others would make. Students, think of five things about yourself that you might be able to offer to someone else. Are you brave and bold or energetic? Now let's take a minute to think a bit more about colors. As we know, our emotions change all the time, so it can be hard to look at a painting and try to make our mood match a color in the artwork. Plus, different colors mean different things to different people. What if we look at this painting in terms of food and our experiences with food? Take a minute and write down one food item that you can think of that matches the colors in the painting healthy or unhealthy, foods you like, don't like, don't think too hard about it. I will do the same and show you my answers. Now imagine a time when you ate those foods. Where were you? What were you doing? For example, were you eating strawberries at the beach? Finally, let's put a feeling with those experiences. Eating strawberries at the beach made me feel peaceful and relaxed. Let's put it all together in a poem. Here is what I came up with. When I first saw this painting, I felt overwhelmed. I thought of bubble gum when I saw the pink. It reminded me of going on a long car ride for a vacation. Pink is the color of excitement. I thought of broccoli when I saw the green. It reminded me of family dinners. Green is the color of togetherness. I thought of lemons when I saw the yellow. It reminded me of lemonade on a hot summer day. Yellow is the color of enjoyment. Putting my own thoughts and memories together, this painting is about excitement, togetherness, and enjoyment. Teacher, pause the screen so students can copy and fill in the blanks or discuss as a group. As a class, celebrate the similarities and differences in your answers. We have come to the end of the session. I want to thank you for playing along and coming on this journey with me. I hope you learned something new and different about yourself and your classmates. Join us for an extension of this session in the one-hour synchronous art-making workshop. Book online.